Hey everyone, how's it going? Experience points are an essential part of Pokemon games. In modern Pokemon games, all Pokemon gain experience points whether you win a battle by battling a trainer or catching a Pokemon. So of course, we're going to modify Pokemon Emerald to make sure we don't gain experience points. Now I did this challenge before in Pokemon Crystal, but in Emerald, there are a couple things that I think will make this much, much, much harder. And I'm really excited to see how this run goes. I've been doing Pokemon challenges for a really long time now. And I'm going to be honest, this was probably one I've been looking forward to the most. Now, let's get to the rules. Most of the rules are ones you've seen in almost all of my challenges. No items, set mode, etc. Some unique rules, just so you know. We're not using any legendary Pokemon whatsoever. We're going to stick to one species of Pokemon at a time. So... Maybe I'll catch a Geodude, then a Graveler later, but at one time we can only have one Geodude or Graveler in the party, just to kind of be fun, and no daycare and no pick up rare candies. I'm allowed to use rare candies in the overworld, those are part of the game, but picking up rare candies or the daycare would just nullify the challenge. So that's it for the unique rules to this challenge. Let's talk about how difficult Roxanne is going to be, because think about it. Since we can't gain any experience points, there really aren't that many useful Pokemon for Roxanne. Like Mudkip would be super great if it had Water Gun, which it doesn't get at level 5. So I'm going to pick the starter I actually used in my first playthrough of Emerald, Trico. Because Emerald is green and Trico is green. But the biggest reason is that Trico can learn Bullet Seed. In addition, I'm going to catch a bunch of other Pokemon and hopefully in combination, we're going to be able to beat Roxanne. And this is kind of what we're going to have to do going forward. We're pretty much going to have to replace our team for every single gym leader, which is super exciting. As someone who only gets to use a single Pokemon for an entire run, having to use like 30 different Pokemon is really fun. But all right, all right, this intro's lasted way too long. Let's talk about Roxanne. All right, so I made sure my Trico had enough speed that it would outspeed Geodude. And it seems to be a three hit KO with Bullet Seed, which isn't too bad. The second Geodude is also a three hit KO with Bullet Seed, but now comes out the level 15 Nose Pass, which outspeeds and instantly one shots. Now Taylo does outspeed and here's the strategy. I'm gonna go for Growl and hopefully it's gonna miss. It doesn't. Next, I go into the Slack Off. Slack Off, oh, that's not good. See, the idea was to use Yawn and then swap out and use the Pokemon I actually wanted to use to defeat this thing, my Shroomish. Now we have to speed through this and hope that Slackoth gets knocked out just before Nosepass falls asleep, which of course it doesn't. And now we have Wingle. It does no Water Gun, but it's only at level 5. Thankfully, Rock Toon misses. Actually, it misses twice. So that means we get to use two Growls, and now Shroomish at level 6, the highest level Shroomish I can catch. We're just going to use Absorb and hope we can Absorb. Now the AI for Roxanne is a little bit broken. It doesn't like to use Rock Tomb unless it's going to knock out, so Absorb is super helpful. The other thing that's helpful is Shroomish's ability is Effect Spore, and I really, really would like Nosepath to get poisoned. I believe it's a 30% chance every time it uses Tackle, but of course, it hasn't gotten Effects Board and then it crits, which ignores the Growls. So we're gonna have to try again. And by try again, I mean try again like 30 times. Unfortunately, as I would find out, the 3 hit KO is actually a range, and it can be a 4 hit KO to knock out these Geodude. You can see right here, the second Geodude took 4 hits. Sometimes Rock Tomb would miss, which would be great, but most of the time, 80% of the time in fact, it would not. We're still using the exact same strategy here. The only real difference is that Slackoth now has Quick Claw, but once again, we have to play a little game of chicken, try to get Nosepass to knock us out right before it's about to fall asleep. Yawn has a delay, and that does happen. So now that Nosepass is asleep, Wingull can start spamming Growl. That's two Growls. Don't forget, that's now four Growls in total. Five Growls, and this is pretty good. With five Growls, Tackle will be doing a lot less than the last time. And with Tackle doing a lot less, unless we run out of Absorbs, which is possible, we could win. The biggest X factor is whether Nosepass will get Effect Spore. 
The last few times it's been effects board, unsurprisingly, because it's my luck, it's been paralyzed, which is the worst status effect. If it's asleep, it can't deal damage to me, and if it's poisoned, it's going to faint rather quickly. Unfortunately for me, Roxanne has a bunch of potions. She in fact has 50 extra hit points. Two from potions and one from Orenberry. And it takes a really long time and it's looking really close. We do put it to sleep, which again at this point I'd much rather poison and I'm starting to run out of absorbs. However, I am at full HP and as I look at my power points, we should have enough like we talked about, due to weird AI, Roxanne didn't use Rock Tomb, which would have been devastating. And so after just 15 minutes of attempts, with Pokemon no higher than level 8, which didn't even really battle, we defeat Roxanne. The next gym leader we're going to battle is in fact Brawly. We could theoretically skip Brawly till much later, but there's really no reason to, because Brawly is absolutely wallied. That makes no sense. But he is walled by a pretty easy Pokemon to catch in Granite Cave, which is in Duford. So Brawly doesn't have anything to hit ghosts, and Sableye is Dark Ghost. The Dark isn't great, but the Ghost is. And it's pretty surprising he doesn't have a move like Foresight or Odor Sleuth. Seems like something that would be pretty useful. We don't do a lot of damage to Brawly. We have to use Nightshade and we have the highest level Sableye possible. Nightshade is just going to deal 12 damage each attack, so that's fine. As long as we don't run out of Nightshades, we're fine. Honestly, I have nothing else to say about this battle. We can just speed through Metatite and then Makuhita. There are potions, but we had more than enough Nightshades, and Brawly ended up being a first try victory. Now, I do want to say the No Experience Challenge is kind of cool, because I do feel like, especially in Red and Blue, Game Freak really did want you to catch entirely new teams or use new Pokemon for each gym leader. And so the fact that that's something we're going to be doing, pretty interesting. But the next major battle isn't a gym leader, it's Brendan, the rival. Now, Brendan is pretty difficult. We really don't have that many great Pokemon. And so I just lead with Sableye to do as much damage as possible to Wingle. That didn't really prove effective. You can now see what my team is like. Level 12 Aeron, level 8 Talo, level 13 Gulpin, which is okay. But none of them really do well against Wingle. Thankfully on this route, you can catch electric Pokemon such as Plusle and Minin. They don't know electric moves, which would have been really nice if they did, but they can use Thunder Wave and Quick Attack. And thanks to two straight Parahacks, Minin knocks out Wingle. Next comes out the Bad Lombre. It is weak to Talos Peck, but since we are less than half its level, Peck doesn't do all that much and after Absorb, it practically did nothing. Thankfully on the next turn it goes for Nature Power, so we've taken away about a third of its HP. Now we can go into Sableye and use Nightshade. We get our third Parahax and then our fourth Parahax, so we're getting some incredibly good luck. But I don't know how much luck is going to matter against a level 20 Combuskin. A little bit of good luck there as it knocks out Sableye. And here's my ace in the hole, Gulpin. Gulpin has Yawn. So we've replaced Slackoth for Gulpin, and it was able to use Yawn. Now what happens is Combuskin falls asleep, and we have Aeron use Mudslap. Mudslap doesn't do that much damage, and it's not same type, but it does lower accuracy. Not enough to avoid that double kick, but it does lower accuracy. Now we're going to use Thunder Wave and we're going to use Howl and we're going to try our best after getting hit by that Ember to knock out Combuskin, but didn't work. All that luck and we still lost. So yikes. Thankfully, I did end up finding a strategy that was a little bit more effective. This time we're going to lead not with Plusle, but with our Electrike. Now, Electrike can have either Static or Lightning Rod. We actually have Lightning Rod, which, eh. Since Wingle doesn't attack us with physical attacks, it doesn't matter. And I'm gonna try to use as many Howls as possible so that I get my Tackle as strong as possible so we can do as much damage to Lombre before it inevitably knocks us out. Thankfully, we paralyze it, it goes for Absorb, and then it can't attack. 
we do want to see nature power even though it does more damage actually astonish is perfect and we get really good luck and knock out lombre fun fact the alternate strategy was to use sableye it doesn't realize nature power doesn't work Anyway, now with Gulpin, rather than using Yawn, we're going to use Poison Gas. That's going to take 8 turns to knock out Combuskin, but that means we need to survive for 8 turns. Sableye is going to come out. It unfortunately gets crit, which is awful. Then I have Minin. I can use Quick Attack, which does next to nothing, but Minin is fairly bulky. It's in Blaze range after that first hit, so it is going to knock out Minin, but I did just enough damage that after it knocks out my Trico, Combuskin is going to faint. And although it took all six Pokemon and some luck with Paralysis and Poison from Gulpin, we were able to band together and beat Rival 2. But this is where the celebration ends. Because if you thought we were underleveled for Rival 2, you have no idea what's going to be in store for Watson. Or maybe you do. Go on Bulbapedia and look up the levels of Pokemon you can get in the area surrounding Watson's gym. They are far lower level than his Pokemon. And you know what? Rather than tell you, might as well just show you how bad this is going to go. So Watson leads with a level 20 Voltorb. We counter with a level 9 Geodude, the highest level Geodude we can have. Now, I was hoping Voltorb would go for self-destruct but it ended up going for Rollout, which is interesting. Sableye was not the correct swap-in, but we could theoretically, if it's going to go for Rollout, we could do something else. You see, in Marvel City, in Emerald exclusively, you can actually get the Move Tutor, which will teach you Rollout. Now, I actually went for Mud Spore, which didn't work the way I thought it did, so ignore that. Unfortunately, we get some bad luck. Voltor misses a rollout and thus goes for self-destruct, requiring a reset. Because the strategy is that if we knock out Voltorb with rollout, the next Pokemon that comes out is Electrike. Actually, I should just show, not tell. But yes, so we knock out the Voltorb and then Electrike comes out. We're going to one-shot it. Now I have nothing to do versus Magneton. So I just get knocked out. It is, well, two and a half times my level. Gulpin can go for Yawn. We do have Quick Claw, which you get in Rustboro City. Unfortunately, it's only a 20% chance to activate. Oddish can theoretically tank a Shockwave, but it can't actually do anything other than use Sweet Scent, which doesn't really help since we don't have moves where accuracy is really an issue. I don't know what to do. I'm kind of stuck. Sableye can't tank a Shockwave. And Minin, as we talked about, in this game, you actually can paralyze electric Pokemon, but Minin can't really deal any damage. Yeah, see that face? That is the face of someone who desperately needs a haircut and also someone who doesn't know what to do. I've been battling Watson for 10 minutes. I've adjusted my strategy slightly to lead with Gulpin, who can tank Spark. Then Voltorb's going to go for Shockwave or Spark. It's going to fall asleep, and that allows me to safely set up Defense Curl and Rollout. Mud Spore goes away once Geodude switches, so using it is pointless since it can't affect Geodude. If only we had a little more attack, by the way. Maybe Electric would have been knocked out by a fourth turn, and then we could have get a fifth turn against Magneton. That would be nice, but instead, I anticipate the Shockwave and swap out Geodude, and, hmm, that kind of gives me a bit of an idea. I mean, I can paralyze Magneton, but like, uh, you know, the AI in this game, especially in the early gyms, is pretty rudimentary. And seeing as it went for Shockwave every single time, and it went for Sonic Boom every time against Geodude. I mean, that's doing decent damage, but it can't tank a Shockwave. I actually think I have an idea, because this won't work. We're just not dealing enough damage. Even if we get a few Parahacks, there's just nothing we can do. We don't deal enough damage. If Geodude had Magneton, that'd be great. By the way, for those of you saying just use Rock Smash, it can't use Rock Smash outside of battle. 
until you defeat Watson. And defeat Watson we shall, with what we can call Faulkner strats. Why? Because if you've watched videos where Falconer is really difficult, this is something I do a lot. So once again, we're going to do the exact same thing with defense curl and rollout. But this time when we get to Magneton, things are going to go a little bit different. Because we know that what's about to happen is Sonic Boom. So Sableye actually went for Super Sonic, which is interesting. Sableye can tank that, but now it's going to have to one-shot Sableye because it can with Shockwave. So I'm going to swap in Geodude, which means it's going to go for either Super Sonic or Sonic Boom, which means I can swap in Sableye. And we can call these Falconer strats because we use these to get rid of Mud Slap on Falconer's Pidgey and Pidgeotto. But unlike Mud Slap, which only has 10 power points, Shockwave has 20. So we're going to fast forward this quite a bit in order to get to a point where Magneton does not have any more Shockwaves. And once it doesn't have any more shockwaves, other than using supersonic, it actually has no way to directly damage Sableye. So once again, Sableye's early ghost typing is going to come in clutch. Now, I could be a little more careful here. I could switch, force it to use up all its supersonics, but it's really not necessary. As you're going to see, it does eventually run out of supersonics, starts going for Sonic Boom, and slowly but surely, we almost knock out Magneton, because once it does run out of Sonic Boom and Super Sonic, I can get a little cheeky and swap in Geodude to use Defense Curl Rollout Strats, and because Manectric doesn't have a great way to damage even a level 9 Geodude, see it goes for Howl, we can hit that crit actually is huge, and now we come close to knocking it out, Oh, so close, but that was a fourth turn, and this is a fifth turn, and after 20 minutes, with much of my Twitch chat telling me that this would be impossible, I have beaten Watson. And let me tell you, without exaggeration, if you think this is the toughest battle, please keep watching. You have no idea how difficult this game is going to get. However, in the short term, it does get a little bit easier. Because once we unlock Rock Smash, we get access to a lot more roots and some stronger Pokemon. So let's go and show the Maxi battle, which can be difficult. We lead with Slugma, which is going to take the place of Gulpin. The idea was to use Yawn, but it gets crit, but its Flame Body activates, which means that Mighty Yenna is going to have to go for Bite Yenna. So Viper is a pretty strong Pokemon, and it has Poison Tail, which can't poison because it's already burned. And Mighty Yenna is slowly going to get knocked out. We're going to force Maxi to waste their Super Potions. And eventually, although it's going to actually be required to use another Pokemon, Solrock at level 18, our highest level Pokemon, knocks out the Mighty Yenna and almost knocks out Zubat. Unfortunately, gets confused. So I swap into Meryl. Meryl isn't a great water Pokemon, but it does have thick fat and that might help versus Flannery. Super Potion doesn't fully restore health, so we can use Rock Throw to knock it out. Then we can keep using Rock Throw against Camera Up. Eventually what we can do, ah, uh, that crit really mattered. Oh, that crit really mattered. Hey, that miss mattered. Hey, we won. I was gonna say we could use Meryl's Water Gun to knock it out, but we didn't even need to. Nice. We won. But that maxi battle was a little lucky in places. And as you can tell, my Pokemon are still pretty underleveled. They're going to be about half the level of Flannery's Pokemon. And the best water Pokemon we have, the type that is best against Flannery in my opinion, eh, it's Meryl, which sucks. So what are we going to do? Well, we can lead with Slugma and use Yawn. Now, in theory, the idea once Slugma faints is we can swap in Meryl and try for Defense Curl Rollout, the strategy that worked versus Watson. In practice, however, Meryl, especially without huge power, just doesn't do a whole lot of damage. And so this kind of proved super, super ineffective. What proved more effective was the Pokemon that came in next, Nummel. Now, Nummel has Magnitude, which is a very luck-based move. It can be between Magnitude 4 and Magnitude 10, and the base power varies wildly. 
you want to see high magnitudes. And we actually get really lucky with the critical hit, bringing us to Torkoal. Unfortunately, Torkoal has White Herb and Overheat, which is just overpowering. And we do have Spoink, which has Thick Fat, but its defense leaves a lot to be desired, and Torkoal has Body Slam. Now, in theory, we could poison it with Poison Tail. In practice, it can't tank it Overheat, so Viper that is. And while Soul Rock resists Overheat, Rock Throw doesn't do all that much. And eventually, Torkoal goes for Overheat in the Sun, and we have to start over. So yeah, remember how I said the game gets easier? That was true for all of one major battle. Flannery, I spent more than double the amount of time than Watson, if you can believe it. Nothing about Flannery is easy. All her Pokemon have Overheat, and it does so much damage, especially in the sun. Even the Pokemon with Thick Fat and even the Pokemon that resist can't stand up to it. And because I don't really have water Pokemon with Surf or anything, it's not as if I can knock these Pokemon out quickly, giving them many, many opportunities to destroy my team. In a lot of cases in these runs, when you're losing again and again and again making small changes, sometimes you need to make bigger changes. And the bigger change we made was relying on luck. We're going to have to rely on Nummel a lot more heavily than I was hoping. We get a Magnitude 7, which doesn't knock out the opposing Nummel, but it goes for Sunny Day and Magnitude 8 does. We do outspeed Slugma, Magnitude 6 does not knock out Slugma, but Light Screen is fine, and Magnitude 8, of course, would have even at full health. Now out comes Camera Up, and I don't want to tank an Overheat. I can't tank an Overheat. Meryl can't either, but it served as fodder, I guess. Now we can send out Spoink. Spoink can use Psybeam, which with a crit did a lot of damage, but without a crit doesn't actually do all that much damage, and Nummel likes to use Attract. So we can go into Soul Rock here. It goes for Tackle, which is actually pretty good, and we can try and chip away. The unfortunate thing here, as we're trying to confuse it with Confusion, is that Flannery has Hyper Potions, and that means it just gets a full heal. We can swap Spoink back in, forcing the camera up to go for overheat does nothing so we can force it to go for tackle which doesn't do very much and it used up one of its overheats and in fact spoink was doing such great damage i just left it in and now in theory soul rock should be able to knock it out with rock throw of course in practice we miss the sun fades we have orin berries and we don't get the range but it doesn't heal again and now we've made it to torkoal with quite a few pokemon so I'm just going to try and damage it as much as I can with Rock Throw. Of course, it doesn't do almost anything. We can get Torkoal to use up its White Herb, but it's still got a full powered overheat. So I swap into Machop and I go for Seismic Toss. Then we get an overheat miss. I go for Seismic Toss again, overheat hits, and now finally the Torkoal has a reduced overheat. And now it's up to Nummel to get a good Magnitude, and we win. And we get Magnitude 8 with the crit. That's right. In the end, it was relying on quite a bit of luck. I could have theoretically swapped into Slugma to try and tank an Overheat. It wouldn't have tanked it, by the way. Slugma had Quick Claw and Yawn, which is something I was going to do to try and get as many Magnitudes as possible. But with that Clutch Overheat miss, we were able to weaken Torkoal enough that Nummel was able to knock it out by itself. And yeah, pretty good luck. But how difficult this battle was goes to show you that levels aren't as important as good matchups. With Watson, we had good matchups. With Flannery, we had pretty bad matchups. And we tried our best. Unfortunately, when it comes to Norman, there really aren't that many more Pokemon available. The only route that gets unlocked is the Sand Route on Route 111. And there is a really good Pokemon I can get, but otherwise, for the fifth consecutive Gym Leader, we're going to be severely underleveled, trying to defeat some pretty good Pokemon. Alright, so we're going to start off using a Desert Pokemon I don't really think is going to do that great in Cacnea. But what Cacnea can do, one of the only Pokemon we have that can do this, is it can use Leech Seed which is pretty good because not only does Leech Seed damage Spinda and can't really be removed, but it also is going to heal my other Pokemon. So 
the chance that Spinda actually knocks anything out, pretty small, especially when I can swap in Soul Rock. And although we're not going to completely heal, we're probably going to have, I don't know, maybe three quarters to half our HP for the rest of this battle. But you can see Soul Rock is still pretty underleveled. Unfortunately, I do end up hitting myself in confusion. But after we swap in Skarmory, with 40 out of 48 HP, we knock out Spinda. Next comes out Vigoroth. Now, all I can really do is go for Sand Attack here because I don't know what else to do. I could swap in Slugma and try to burn it, and that's exactly what happens. So what I think I should do now is swap in Cacnea, go for Leech Seed, hope Slash doesn't crit, which it didn't. And now, in theory, we could swap in Machop and start using Karate Chop with Guts Poison. Instead, I decide to play it a little safer and go into Soul Rock, forgetting that Vigoroth, in fact, had Faint Attack. So because of that, I'm going to swap in Skarmory again, and with Leech Seed, we have 26 HP for Lanoon. Now, I know Lanoon has Belly Drum, which is bad. So I'm just going to go for Sand Attack again until I faint. I only get one off, which is annoying. Now we can go into Machop and... I'm just going to go for Karate Chop. Unfortunately, Headbutt does a ton to me. And so that was a little underwhelming. Cacnea, I'm going to try to use Leech Seed, but Headbutt is no match, Nia. And yeah, I think we're going to have to reset. We still didn't use my Ace in the Hole, Sand Slash. You can catch a Sand Shrew, and there are a bunch of rare candies. Using one of them here seems pretty clutch, giving us a fully evolved Pokemon. But I'm not quite sure how we're going to use it yet. I haven't taught it Dig in case we need to use it later. In theory, that could cheese slacking, but right now we have to do a little bit more experimenting, figuring out the right order to send out Pokemon and how to best get to slacking. Well, I've been battling for 15 minutes and we haven't even made it to slacking yet, which is bad. The start of the battle goes exactly the same as, well, not exactly the same, but pretty much the same as you've seen before with knocking out the Spinda, just try to have as much HP as possible for Vigoroth. Now we go for Sand Attack. This is the same thing as before, but we're going to let Skarmory faint. And once we get that miss, we have Leech Seed up on Vigoroth, which means I can swap in Sand Slash. Now, Vigoroth has Encore, which it used. And this is Sand Slash's time to shine. We get a crit. You can see Sand Slash actually has terrific defense, which is why I want to use it. I just didn't want to waste it. But good thing it was out here because Lanoon went for Belly Drum and that would have wrecked my whole team if not for the fact that Slash with its increased critical hit ratio got a crit there. That's huge and for the first time I've made it to Slacking. Of course, I don't have Dig yet. I go for Slash to see how much it does and thankfully Slacking goes for Counter. I was surprised they outsped. Slacking can't attack this turn because of Truant so I swap into Slugma hoping for Quick Claw Yawn it's a risky strat, but the 1 in 5 coin flip pays off. It hits with Faint Attack, but now it's going to fall asleep, and it's up to Machop. I'm going to go for Focus Energy. It's asleep. I have Guts. I have an increased critical hit move, increased critical hit move, and I get a crit. It stays asleep, and oh, we come so close to knocking it out, but because of Citrus Berry, Slacking actually doesn't heal. Unfortunately, it wakes up and knocks out Machop. Now, I can go, though, into Cacnea and play this a little safe. I can go for Leech Seed. Slacking has an immense amount of health. And because it can only attack every other turn, oh, there goes the Hyper Potion, Sand Slash probably, but not definitely, might be able to out-damage it, especially with Leech Seed. At first, that proves not to be true. It does too much, but I have Defense Curl, so I can buff my defense by a couple stages, and look how much I got with Leech Seed. Then I get the crit, it goes for Yawn, and I don't know if it has another Hyper Potion. It doesn't. Once again, I was forced to use incredibly underleveled Pokemon. Once again, it took a while, but there was a strategy that got me past Norman. Five Gym Leaders down, three to go. It is after Norman, however, that a huge section of the game opens up. You can now go all the way to Lily Cove if you want, and there are many, many, many Pokemon along the way that are at much higher levels than the ones we've seen. And so by the time we face Winona, you're not going to recognize my team at all. 
Like always, the first battle is just a scouting battle. We're going to see what she likes to do and what Pokemon we should use in what order. Now, introducing level 36 Tentacruel. You can get up to level 35 Tentacruel in the water, and with the rare candy, that becomes a level 36 Tentacruel. This is why using your rare candies in smart situations is so important. Unfortunately, this Tentacruel doesn't do enough to knock out Altaria with Ice Beam, but Earthquake doesn't do enough to knock out Tentacruel, allowing it to battle later. Now, Skarmory comes out, and I have either Magneton or Manectric. I decide to go into Manectric because I don't actually know why I decide to go into Manectric, but here comes Tropius. Tropius is going to be really, really annoying, but thankfully, Tentacruel survived, right? So we can use Ice Beam, and it does do enough to knock out Tropius. Now we're at Pelipper. It knocks out Tentacruel, but and in this case, Manectric is faster. We're going to use Spark with Manectric, and boom. I spent like half an hour trying to catch that Magneton, and in the end, I never used it. <laughs> there are a lot of Pokemon I caught that I thought might be useful, but Winona was a first try victory. Pretty good. Tate and Liza won't be. They're not as bad as in solo runs where you have to go 1v2, but they have super high level Pokemon and they synergize well. So I wasn't looking forward to their battle. Before that, we do have to battle Maxi again, and I only show this battle because it was pretty fun. So you can see that level 36 Tentacruel is still my best Pokemon. This is unsurprising. It's actually hard to catch a Pokemon higher than level 36. But this Tentacruel, although it's confused, could have theoretically swept through the team. Instead, we're going to have to rely on some slightly different strats. I'm going to go and use Chimeco, my new Yawn Pokemon. So we've gone from Slackoth to Gulpin to Nummel to Chimeco. Graveler is going to replace Nummel as being our Magnitude user, and we get a very clutch Magnitude 8 followed by a very unclutch Magnitude 5. Thankfully, Camera Up stays asleep. And now out comes the Crobat. And you know what? It goes for Confuse Ray. I hit myself in Confusion. It goes for Bite. I use Self-Destruct. And Graveler? <laughs> that was great. So Chimeco and Graveler, who I thought would serve a very useful purpose going forward, really didn't get to do much outside this battle. But to thank them for their service, I included it in the video. But all right, all right, no more stalling. Let's talk about Tate and Liza. You'll notice a couple newcomers on the team, including Sharpedo and Celio, both of whom couldn't be acquired before this point. So we're going to see what happens when we use Crunch. Eh, didn't do that great. Earthquake knocks out Sharpedo. And we're going to see how much Surf does. You can see I still have my level 36 Tentacruel, but of course, oh, that's not good. Um, oh, that's really not good. Huh. Okay. How do I do this? In theory, you know what? Maybe Chimeco can be used to yawn and it avoids Earthquake and Wobbuffet can be used as... I wonder if this knocks it out. I'm going to go for counter here. This is a strat we do a lot in minimum battles, but because Wobbuffet's at level 29, the highest level we could catch... Counter actually is the play here instead of Destiny Bond. Now I could go for Destiny Bond. Ah, that crit probably mattered because if Quick Claw activated and we use Destiny Bond, that's two Pokemon knocked out by Wobbuffet. Now we put Zatu to sleep and we're going to try to put Soul Rock to sleep. No, I went for Uproar because at this point I was like, oh, Sleep Claws, you can only have one Pokemon to sleep at a time. What's wrong with you, Jaros? Anyway, I end up losing the battle, which is unsurprising because that was really, really dumb. So let's be slightly less dumb. Instead of Chimeco, I'm going to go for Zatu here and go for Nightshade. And the reason I do that is because it can't get hit by Earthquake. Counter will knock out the Claydol. And Tate and Liza Zatu is now at about 75% HP. Like I told you before, the Psychic Crit mattered. I go for Destiny Bond, and because the AI isn't really good at knowing Destiny Bond is active, it's still going to target and knock out Wobbuffet, meaning Zatu gets knocked out. So I guess my Zatu didn't really do much. Now we have two Surfers, Sharpedo and Tentacruel. Of course, I went for Crunch and got the crit, and that means this is GG. That crit probably mattered more than I want to admit, but I think we still would have won with Celio. 
even if it didn't. But in the end, Flannery, who I thought would be easy, has so far taken the longest, and Tate and Liza, who I thought would take forever, took only three battles, thanks to Wavafet. There's only one other gym leader remaining. The Archie battle isn't too exciting, so I'm not really gonna show it, because I have a feeling the Elite Four are gonna take like 50 years. So let's not waste time and skip ahead to the final gym leader, Juan. Alrighty, so Juan, an Emerald exclusive gym leader, leads with his Love Disc. Now, in theory, I could have caught a level 45 Whiskash, but with the Super Rod, you can catch level 40 Whiskash, which I have, and Earthquake did some pretty decent damage, and Water Pulse does nothing, we knock it out. Next comes out Juan's Whiskash, which goes for Amnesia, I went for Surf, which was dumb. It goes for Rain Dance, Earthquake was the much better play there. Water Pulse doesn't do very much to me, and I knock out Whiskash with my Whiskash. Next comes out Celio. Celio goes for Water Pulse. It's raining. We don't do half, but Whiskash did pretty good. Now I can send in Sharpedo. Sharpedo has Crunch. Crunch does pretty decent. Body Slam, Rough Skin. Unfortunately, that's going to necessitate a heal. And we are eight levels under leveled. We drop Spidef. Body Slam. It may heal again. I'm not really sure. I'm just going to go into Tentacruel here and go for Surf. Knocks out Celio. The scariest Pokemon is perhaps Kingdra. I do have Ice Beam. I go for Barrier just in case it wants to start going for physical moves. And thankfully it goes for Ice Beam. Then it starts trying to set up Double Team, which is bad. And I start missing with Acid, which is also bad. Um, what we can maybe do here if we want to is try to see if Wobbuffet can tank. We could also go for Mirror Code if I want to be really greedy. Eh, let's try it. Yeah, that worked. And now, Crawdond, if we outspeed... Oh, we don't. Quick Claw, maybe. I also caught a level 40 Whalmer, which, of course, with a rare candy, I evolved into a level 41 Waylord. It knows Water Spout, which at full HP is 150 base power. Thankfully, Crawdond doesn't attack us, meaning on our first try, not really knowing what we were doing, we have another victory. So the final three gym leaders definitely proved a heck of a lot easier than the first three. But if you think that means for one second that the Elite Four was easy, I advise you to take a look at how much video is remaining. I don't think you or I was truly prepared for just how nightmarish the Elite Four would be. First trainer is Dark Type Elite Four member Sydney. Mighty Anna has Intimidate, so Waylord's Water Spout probably will deal the most damage, and it almost knocks it out in one hit. Unfortunately, it doesn't. But then Sydney actually switches into Cacturn. That allows me to switch into Altaria. We haven't really used it yet. And Altaria has Fly, which is its strongest flying move. It's going to take one more to knock out Cacturn, and it does. So that's two down with no Pokemon down for me. Next comes out Absol, which goes for Rock Slide and knocks out Altaria. And here comes Hariyama. I always like to conserve TMs for key spots and bulk up with something I've conserved for this exact moment. After one bulk up, it knocks out Absol. It doesn't actually outspeed Shiftry, but Brick Break, which you can get in Cetopolis, does knock it out. Mighty Anna is going to heal. So this is just neutral, no buffs, and it's not enough to knock out Mighty Anna. I probably should have used bulk up there, but that's okay. After Double Edge, it actually almost knocks itself out. I go for another Brick Break, and then Crawdon goes for Swords Dance, and while I don't knock it out, Strength actually doesn't quite do enough, even after Swords Dance, to knock me out, and that is Sydney. I think you can tell Sydney's going to be fairly easy. Fweb, on the other hand, or Phoebe, as some people pronounce her name wrongly, is going to be a lot trickier. Phoebe leads with Dusclops. Now, Dusclops always, well not always, but almost always goes for Protect turn 1, and sometimes it doubles up on Protect. Now, we have Exploud, which we were able to catch in Victory Road, and Exploud as Shadow Ball. But, once I get confused, I swap into Waylord, but then Dusclops decides to use Curse. That gives me an opportunity, as it heals, to swap into Altaria, and try to set up some Dragon Dances. I only set up one, and Fly just doesn't do very much. But after Curse, Exploud will knock it out with Shadow Ball. Again, this is the first time I'm battling Phoebe, so I'm not sure what exactly is going to happen. Next comes out Binette. Faint Attack doesn't do much, and unfortunately, 
we don't quite do half. It tries to go for grudge, which would take away all my power points. Thankfully, I actually do not knock it out. And then it goes for Will-O-Wisp, which is annoying, but Shockwave will knock it out. Shockwave is for Gyarados later on. Then I freeze Sableye. Since I'm burned, special attacks make more sense. Phoebe doesn't have a full restore to use, so I knock out the Sableye. Now out comes another Binette. It goes for Facade and knocks me out. Now I have to decide who I'm going to go to. I go for Wobbuffet, and I just try to use Destiny Bond. Unfortunately, we don't get Quick Claw, and we get knocked out. Now, Hariyama doesn't really have anything. I forgot to teach it another move to damage Binette, so I pretty much do nothing. Then I can go into Whiskash. I get my special defense drop. Earthquake does a lot, and Psychic doesn't knock it out. Here is the other full restore that PD still has. Surf does a little bit less, you can see. Now all I have left are Waylord as well as Altaria. Waylord gets knocked out by Thunderbolt. And Altaria, probably not going to survive too long. Nah, Shadow Ball knocks it out. I spent a very, very, very long time trying to figure out Phoebe, and I went through multiple different strategies. After a lot of trial and error, here's what I decided. I go for Shadow Ball just in case it doesn't go for Protect. Unfortunately, it doubles up. And then Dusclops seems to like to go for Curse. So that's good. I swap into Waylord as it goes to heal. Now, Waylord outspeeds, and with Water Spout, I actually do about half damage. If you get a crit, it knocks it out, which is pretty lucky. Now, this is the Binette with Thunderbolt, so I swap into Whiskash, and I go for Earthquake. Shadow Ball, as you saw, oh, another lucky crit. But as you saw, Shadow Ball would be a 3 at KO. So we get really lucky so far, and I let this Binette knock out Whiskash. Now we can swap back into its Splout. We have Citrus Berry, unfortunately Will-O-Wisp first turn, which you don't want to see. Then it goes for Grudge, I go for Shadow Ball again, just trying to get a special defense drop, but it doesn't happen. And then I go for Shockwave because I don't want Grudge to take away Ice Beam, and it goes for Faint Attack. So at the end of the day, Exploud actually did its job, and then Sableye knocks it out. Now, Waylord actually will outspeed Sableye, and it comes very, very close to knocking it out with Water Spout. Since it's damaged me, I go for Surf, which is a little bit weaker. I only have one power point left, but Water Spout is still a little bit more powerful, and it knocks out the Sableye. Now all that's left is the final Dusclops. This is a much more offensive set than the first one. When there's one Pokemon remaining, you want a Quick Claw Destiny Bond. We don't get it. It's a nice strategy to use, but we're going to have to rely on Altaria and Hariyama. Unfortunately, this Dusclops does have Ice Beam. I go for Dragon Breath. I don't get the Paralysis. I go for it again. I don't get it again. So it's all up to Hariyama. Now, Hariyama has been taught Rock Tomb. I go for Belly Drum, max out my attack. Shadow Ball doesn't quite knock me out. And Rock Tomb hits. That was an 80% chance. And I'll tell you right now, that is not the ideal strategy for Phoebe, but it got the job done. Speaking of unideal strategies, let's talk about Glacia. So Hariyama has Thick Fat, which halves the damage it takes from Ice-type moves. Now, here's a fun little fact. Celio is always going to go for Hail turn 1, unless it can knock you out. So, I go for Belly Drum, and then Brick Break. Unfortunately, the Glalie outspeeds and still does decent damage with Ice Speed. Now we have 56 health, and we should lose here. Except in Generation 3, Blizzard can still miss in Hail, and that way we knock out Celio. Next comes out Glalie 2. Uh, that's not really what it's called. And Shadow Ball will knock out Hariyama. But we have five Pokemon for just four remaining. I decide Waylord is the best strategy. Unfortunately, I did run out of Water Spouts and forgot to use Ether. but Glalie likes to use Explosion to knock out a Pokemon. And that means there's a 4-on-1 with Wobbuffet still remaining, and it can potentially tank Ice Beam, which it does. Unfortunately, I get frozen. So, yeah, great. Whiskash now has to rely on Earthquake. Walrein, meanwhile, uses Sheer Cold, which has a pretty high chance to miss. Now, unfortunately, it looks like we're going to put it right in healing range. I mean, unless I got a critical hit, there's no way we win, and... Well, would you look at that? First try victory versus Glacia. So far, so good, right? Well, 
it's all about to come falling down. Let's talk about Drake. Drake's first Pokemon is Shelgon, which isn't all that great. It also likes to use Protect Turn 1. So Explode has Ice Beam, which does about three quarters. And that freeze was kind of nice. So we can knock out the Shelgon. Now Altaria, it's double weak to Ice Beam, but it's an Explode. So we don't quite do enough. However, after double edge, well, it wouldn't have mattered. Anyway, we knock it out. Next comes out Kingdra. Kingdra actually doesn't knock out Explode with Body Slam, but it does on the second try. Now, Altaria, I'm going to try to go for Dragon Dance just to outspeed, but then I realize I should probably go for Dragon Breath and try to paralyze Kingdra, which I do, but I also then put it within healing range. I'm going to go for Dragon Dance to once again outspeed just because, I don't know, it seems like a good idea. After two Dragon Dances, Fly should be doing more, and even with all those double teams, we still hit. Unfortunately, it doesn't do very much damage and Altaria gets knocked out. Now I really don't have a great Pokemon to use. I think a lot about it and I decide to send in Whiskash. Whiskash goes for Earthquake, Surf doesn't knock it out, and we do put it within healing range but it can't heal. Hariyama could have Vital Throw at this point. I don't, but I hit through the double teams, I hit through Smoke Screen, and I do knock it out bringing in Flygon. Earthquake doesn't quite knock me out, Brick Break does decent damage, and then Earthquake knocks me out. Now we have Waylord. Unfortunately, Waylord cannot outspeed Flygon. It can tank an Earthquake, but Crunch then knocks it out. And that was a pretty decent first attempt, but in the end, we didn't even make it to the final Pokemon. Let's talk about what happens when we do make it to the final Pokemon. So I've changed up my strategy a little bit since Shelgon does like to use Protect, where we could set up a couple bulk ups. Protect fails and I hit with Brick Break. Now, sometimes Drake will swap and I hit with Rock Tomb. That is going to slow Altaria down. I don't outspeed it yet, but after that second Rock Tomb, I will. And we hit with three consecutive Rock Tombs, knocking out Altaria. Now Shelgon comes back out. It goes for Protect. That's fine. I'm going to keep going for Brick Break. I don't have that many left. It goes for Double Edge, I go for Brick Break, and then Full Restore. That's actually okay. If I hit with a couple more Rock Tombs, things will be perfect. And now we've set things up where Explode will be able to knock it out with just one Ice Beam, and that's going to bring out Kingdra. Now, Kingdra, funny enough, is a range on Wobbuffet right now. So it goes for Smokescreen, which is great, and that means I can go for a Destiny Bond for free. I have five Power Points, and it does take a while for Kingdra to actually attack, but after a Dragon Dance, Body Slam will always one-shot, and the most dangerous Pokemon, Kingdra, knocks itself out. Now, here's the issue. We don't one-shot Flygon, and we don't outspeed it. And that's an issue, because even though Flygon's gonna heal, since it outspeeds us, we can get it to very low health, but we can't knock it out. We can save, oh, went for Crunch there. I was hoping for Earthquake, but we can save Exploud for Salamence, but here is why we cannot win right now. So Salamence comes out, outspeeds, knocks out Altaria. Don't forget, Wobbuffet's gone. Whiskash can't really do anything. Waylord, right now, I didn't know what its final move was going to be, and I was just kind of testing things out. It outspeeds, and Dragon Claw actually pretty much one-shots. I think it always one-shots right now, Exploud. And so Whiskash, although it has enough special defense to survive one Dragon Claw, I didn't see a pathway to winning. I'm going to show you a final battle just really quickly here. So we still are using Hariyama as our lead, and we get pretty decent luck, and we have Explode at full health. Now this time, we actually use Altaria and Whiskash to knock out the Kingdra, and then we use Altaria to paralyze Flygon, allowing us to outspeed and knock it out. But here is the key part of the battle. Remember how I said it one-shots? Well, I wasn't correct. It doesn't actually one-shot, but it pretty much does the next best thing. Without a critical hit, I don't one-shot, and it outspeeds. Now, if I got Destiny Bond there, we would've won. But I don't, and since Waylord really doesn't have anything good, and Dragon Claw pretty much knocks it out anyway, there's no hope. I spent an hour on Drake, trying all the various permutations of Pokemon, using Wobbuffet, trying to get Clutch Counter, everything. I tried everything, and while there's a theoretical chance we can win, in the end, it was just so impractical, 
we needed to make some changes. And that's unfortunate because it does mean we have to go back into the Elite Four, but I think these changes are gonna be worthwhile. Well, it took another half an hour, minus all the prep time to get back. But here's a strategy I use. We lead now with Waylord, not with Hariyama. I actually don't even intend to hit with that Water Spout, typically goes for Protect, but Water Spout plus Blizzard always knocks out. Now I need to knock out Altaria with Waylord. We actually get Altaria to heal, which is good because that gives us a little bit more leeway versus Kingdra. Unfortunately, Blizzard is only 70% accurate and it's a two shot, but Altaria uses double edge and that's what we need. We have now a clean slate. Now the AI in this game actually acts after you. So it knows I'm gonna send out Wobbuffet, which means I can swap in Altaria for Earthquake. And once I have Altaria, the goal is to paralyze Flygon. Once that's accomplished, all I need is for Altaria to faint. I actually used Dragon Claw, which was not what I should have done there because that's going to put the Flygon in healing range, I'm pretty sure. Oh, it can't heal right now. They can only use their Hyper Potions at certain times, so that's good. Now I'm going to swap into Wobbuffet and hope it doesn't go for Sir. It didn't, and it's going to do the Dragon Dance Body Slam strat. Or it's going to go for two Dragon Dances, that's fine. We have five power points, and in Gen 3, you can just use Destiny Bond as many times until it works. Now we're going to send out Hariyama, and Hariyama is going to make this pretty easy, theoretically. It tanks the first Dragon Claw, and then it lowers speed with Rock Tomb, it can actually tank a second Dragon Claw, but it doesn't in this attempt. That's okay. We have Exploud with Ice Beam. Dragon Claw, unfortunately, we don't outspeed because we did not get the second Rock Tomb, which I really wanted. But we do get a Clutch Freeze. And even if we didn't, we had Whiskash with Blizzard. And hopefully that would have worked. But at the end of the day, this battle took me about two hours combined. So I'll take it, a win is a win here. But what if I told you all I got for beating Drake is one of the most difficult, most frustrating final boss battles I've ever had to deal with. Everyone kept telling me, oh, Wallace is easy. It's gonna be easy. Let me tell you right now, Wallace was anything but easy. For the first time in my YouTube career, I seriously considered giving up on a challenge I knew was practical to beat, but I was just so frustrated. You know what? Let me just show you why. So let's start off by talking about Waylord. It outspeeds and water spout 150 base power at full health. One shots almost every Pokemon I have. What about my Waylord? Well, you see, here's the problem with my Waylord. It's lower level, yes, but it also doesn't really have anything good to attack Wallace's Waylord with. So it goes for Rain Dance, I go for Water Spout, it does decent damage, but then its Water Spout hits me, and even with that damage, I'm still knocked down to 1 HP, and then it goes for Blizzard, basically just showing off at this point. So what do I do? I can try to go to Hariyama, right? Water Spout's not going to do as much, but it still does way more than I thought it would. I thought it would be weak as heck, but with Rain, with my weak special defense, that doesn't work. The only thing that I found did work is Wobbuffet. 20% of the time, Wobbuffet goes for Destiny Bond, and that's the only way I could reliably knock out Waylord. Now, this is when I started to figure out that the AI makes switches based on what you do. And I didn't quite know what to swap in after Altaria, so I made a bad swap into Whiskash. Offensive, that would have been good, but defensively, Tentacruel completely obliterated it. And Tentacruel is kind of obliterating everything. Not good. After another five minutes of testing, I come up with this strategy. Wobbuffet is going to lead. There are two options here. The first is that it goes for double edge, and there is a chance it doesn't knock me out. It only seems to go for double edge about one-tenth of the time. So going for counter and hoping I get the coin flip that double edge doesn't actually knock me out really didn't seem worth it, so I just go for Destiny Bond. Alright, so if I swap into Whiskash, Wallace will always swap into Ludicolo, and here is where I made a mistake. I had used and then deleted Aerial Ace on Altaria earlier for Dragon Claw, and this would make things awful. 
After two dragon dances, we do about half, which is pretty good. But now out comes Tentacruel. And although Tentacruel's defense leaves a lot to be desired, I actually miss with Fly. I send out Whiskash, which will tank Hydro Pump. However, unless we get a really clutch miss, we won't knock out Tentacruel, but we do. Now comes out Wallace's Whiskash, and I just have to faint. I have really nothing here, though. I have Hariyama. I can go for the bulk up, but that did about three quarters. Even with Citrus Berry, I won't survive. And it goes for Surf. Now all I have are Waylord and Exploud. I can't outspeed and it actually goes for Amnesia. So a full power Water Spout does nothing. And I have no idea how I'm going to get past this. Or how I would get past Gyarados and Milotic. I'm kind of stuck. After another five minutes of battling, we get an attempt where Wobbuffet actually hits with Destiny Bond. Of course, it's one of those double edge ranges. And the funny thing is, if I had gone for counter, hit the counter, and then used Destiny Bond, things would be easier. But like, it's a 2% chance and there's a lot of resetting. So we go into Altaria. And again, we need to hit with Fly. We're getting really lucky that Ludicolo isn't using Leech Seed, and we also got really lucky that we got a crit. Now, Earthquake won't one-shot Tentacruel, but due to our natural bulk, we tank the Sludge Bomb. Even though I'm poisoned, I have the Citrus Berry, and I knock out Tentacruel. But now out comes Milotic, Wallace's Ace. I go for Earthquake, it does next to nothing. So what am I going to do to knock out this Milotic? I mean, Waylord can wall it okay. It goes for Toxic, but Water Spout does nothing to it. And holy mackerel. No, it can't wall it okay. I have terrible special defense. Um, okay, Hariyama, I choose you. So I go for Rock Tomb to try and slow it down. Surf hits like an absolute truck, and it's a two at KO. Uh, Whiskash, let's go. See what you can do. Surf? nearly one shots earthquake doesn't do nearly enough and now all we have left is exploud secret power doesn't paralyze we survive on one hp but wallace has full restores way more than any other trainer and even though we get some good luck with parahax i see no way we can win at this point so after thinking about it talking to chat doing some damage calcs i use this new strat it's called giving up and you can just see how Waylord absolutely owns my entire team. So if we give up, that's one thing, but it's not like we can just level up like I do in many of my other challenges. That's actually impossible. So what can we do exactly? All we can do is teach new moves, try to get some items I don't have, and potentially maybe a Pokemon I missed or something I didn't think of. But as of right now, things are looking pretty bleak. Now, as you notice, the other Elite Four members weren't easy, notably Drake. And I really, really, really did not want to have to battle Drake again. It took a really long time. Thankfully, you do start to come up with some pretty good strategies. Against Glacia, though, I did come up with a much better strategy. By just using Bulk Up and Brick Break along with the Shell Bell, you pretty much have full HP. And as long as you're not hit by Sheer Cold or something, you actually can deal enough damage not to knock out Walrein, but to get it to use its Citrus Berry and therefore not heal. And then I can just swap in, well, a couple of things. I decide to be cheeky and go for Tentacruel because, well, I'm not sure, but it actually works well for the video because that is the Pokemon I decided would take the place of Whiskash in order to maybe beat Wallace. Tentacruel is super high special defense and can effectively wall Ludicolo as well as Milotic. The only problem is you can't catch a level 43 Tentacruel. I had to pretty much use all the remaining overworld rare candies to level up that level 36 Tentacruel you saw me using earlier. That's right, it's one of the few Pokemon that gets to come back stronger than ever. And we even got enough money to teach it Ice Beam as well as the TM for Giga Drain, which I wasn't really using. So that's the idea. Did it work? Well, I was hoping maybe Tentacruel could take out Waylord, 
because if it could do that, then I wouldn't have to use Wobbuffet. The problem is Double Edge is just too darn strong. Even with Giga Drain helping me out, Waylord does way too much damage and I need Tentacruel for later. So it looks like we're stuck using Wobbuffet meaning only one of every five battles will actually make it to Ludicolo. It can take sometimes five minutes between attempts, which is really frustrating. It's just a matter of luck. But we get Quick Law and Water Spout, which is fine. Also, we don't have Whiskash anymore, but if we send out Waylord, Ludicolo still comes out, which is great. So we can send in Altaria, Giga Drain doesn't do a lot. Now, as it turns out, we need to use a lot more Dragon Dances than I was hoping. And all the while, Ludicolo likes to use Double Team. That's really bad and makes me wish I hadn't taught over Aerial Ace. And in most battles, eventually it will use Leech Seed, which slowly takes your health away. So I used five Dragon Dances and Fly, of course, misses. But since you're seeing the battle, you probably expect that at some point it's going to hit. And it does, but it doesn't knock out Ludicolo and I get critted. I at first look at my PowerPoints thinking, did I not use all five? But as it would turn out, it's not all five, it's six. That's right. My modest nature Altaria is so weak, even with the 10 higher base power of Fly, I need six Dragon Dances to knock out Ludicolo. Now, Tentacruel can actually knock out Ludicolo pretty well, but then I won't have it for my Lodic, but it does have Liquid Ooze, which stacks with both Leech Seed as well as Toxic, which is pretty cool, but this battle is not going to be a victory for me. It can't be a victory because what are we going to do here? Ludicolo faints, and now we have Whiskash. And remember how bad Whiskash was to deal with. I don't even try, I just reset. About three minutes later, I get this battle and we'll speed it up. Wobbuffet does his job and we use all six Dragon Dances and we hit, which is not very common. That's great, we get the knockout. Now out comes Tentacruel. I have Earthquake and I knock out Tentacruel. That's excellent. Now I go for Fly against my Lotic and it does just under half, which is pretty good. Now maybe Tentacruel can go and knock it out the rest of the way. I start with Toxic, but Surf does way more than I want it to. Remember, in Emerald, unless you use Pickup with a level 90 Lanoon, I think, you cannot get leftovers until the post game. And so we're going to have to rely on Citrus Berries, Giga Drain, and Protect to try and get the poison damage to stack up, which is not a really fun strategy. And it requires a lot of math to make sure my Lotic isn't in healing range because Wallace. And there you see my reaction to that. Wallace can use a bunch more full restores than you'd think. Don't believe me? I actually end up sticking with this battle and Wallace uses another full restore. And yeah, yeah. It doesn't seem like my new strategy is faring any better than the old one. After another 10 minutes, I decide to change up the strategy a bit. Rather than swap into Waylord, what if we swap into Tentacruel and bait out the Whiskash? We can swap into Altaria to avoid Earthquake, and maybe we can use Dragon Breath both to weaken Whiskash as well as paralyze it. Giga Drain does just over a third, so after this Hyper Beam, we can send in Tentacruel and knock out Whiskash. But what comes out next is Gyarados, I believe the last Pokemon that we have seen. And Gyarados is really good! Earthquake nearly one-shots Waylord, which can't do anything to Gyarados. We actually do hit with Shockwave, which is great, only because Hyper Beam miss. But even with a critical hit, it doesn't one-shot Gyarados. And that's a bit of a problem, because Hyper Beam does in fact one-shot me. Now, I can go to Hariyama and because of Hyper Beam set up a bulk up. And then it goes for Dragon Dance and I try to hit with Rock Tomb, but of course, Rock Tomb is a chance to miss. So I can go into Tentacruel and do nothing, and this strategy was a bit of a dead end. I was hoping that maybe changing up the order the Pokemon came out in would make a difference, but I realized that in the other strategy, Altaria was taking out two Pokemon and dealing half damage to a third. That's really good value in a run like this, 
and I had to stick with it. Well, things are about to get a lot worse. See, something that's hard to convey in a YouTube video is how long it takes between these attempts. I mean, I can say an hour, but what you need to understand is that 90% of the battles, or 80%, don't make it past Waylord. And then, Ludicolo uses Double Team and Leech Seed. And because I have to use Fly and not Aerial Ace, which I deleted because I didn't think about this exact scenario, because sometimes it's hard to imagine every exact scenario that can possibly occur and all the interactions, I was stuck with Fly, and even though I could set up six Dragon Dances, I wasn't ever able to hit with Fly, and it would sometimes take like half an hour between real attempts. But then this happened. Turns out, even when we do hit, 30% of the time, it's a range. And that is the face of someone who knows they've been beat. That this isn't working. I've made it to Gyarados twice in the last hour, and I've never even come close to beating it. Pretty much every single member of the Elite Four has proven somewhat problematic. I kind of skipped over the part where I lost to Glacia 20 times because I kept using Belly Drum, but now you know. Every single one has beaten me multiple times. And I didn't know what other Pokemon to get. I was looking through all the Pokemon you could catch, but there's just so few at decent levels. And remember, I put all my eggs in the Tentacruel basket. I have no rare candies remaining. So what was I gonna do? That's when an unexpected source made a suggestion. It's one I'd received before, but when Pokemon Superstar Small Ant is in your chat suggesting it, I decided, you know what, might as well try it. And kudos to my chat, they actually helped explain to me how a lot of different things worked. As you can see, the only Pokemon Small Ant can think of is the level 45 Gyarados in Cetopolis. In order to understand what's about to happen, we need to explain a ton of different things about how Pokemon encounters work. So if you look on Bulbapedia, you'll see that Gyarados can appear 20% between level 5 and level 45. But that's not technically how it works. When you actually look into the game's code, it's a little more complicated. And shoutouts to Raccoon Mario from Stream, who is always there by the way, showing me this information. It was extremely helpful. Unless you do hardcore Nuzlocks, you'd never really think about this. But in this run especially, it was very weird that high-level Pokemon seemed way less likely to appear than low-level or mid-level Pokemon, and this graphic explains why. While what you see on Bulbapedia is correct in a sense, it doesn't break it down properly. You see, Pokemon are broken down into various encounter slots and they have different level ranges. And you can see, if we want a level 45 Gyarados, there's only a 5% chance of the 20% that we actually get that Gyarados. But hold on, that's also not correct. Because assuming each of those levels show up at the same rate, which I believe they do, so even if we got encounter slot 9, of which there's only a 4% chance, it can appear at any level between 35 and 45, which means we actually have around a 1 in 200 chance of finding that Gyarados, which sounds awful. But what if I were to tell you we can dramatically increase those odds using one of my favorite Pokemon, Absol. See, I didn't know this before this run, but Pokemon with Vital Spirit, Hustle, or Pressure, if they're in the lead of your party, there is a 50% chance that whatever encounter slot you get so in our case, let's say encounter slot 9, there's a 50% chance it's at level 45, which bumps our odds up from 1 in 200 to 1 in approximately 37. Way, way better odds. This method works in every generation, but only very specific games when it comes to fishing. Thankfully, Emerald is one of those games. Unfortunately, fishing in Emerald is awful. It takes forever to just get a Pokemon, most likely a useless Magikarp. And unlike with running around the grass, even if you're using a device that has speed up like the Retron 5, that will not work here because you won't have enough time to play the dumb mini game and actually fish. So after an hour, finally I got Gyarados. But getting Gyarados is only half the battle. How do we use it? It has really good special moves, but 
really limited in the physical moves, and arguably its best move, Earthquake, I've already taught to Altaria. Furthermore, which Pokemon do I remove for Gyarados? Don't forget, it's not just about battling Wallace. I also need to get to Wallace, and all my Pokemon have proven vital. But after a lot of thinking, I actually ended up making a pretty solid choice. And although Gyarados is definitely not a one-to-one -one replacement, things ended up going pretty well. I decided to replace Waylord, and remember, Waylord actually was my lead versus Sydney. Now it's Gyarados. But although Gyarados' special attack is worse, it's still a two-shot on Mightyena. Like you saw last time, that will bring out Absol, which will bring out the Hariyama. And as long as it doesn't get too, too lucky, and it gets pretty lucky here, we can start knocking out Pokemon. Unfortunately, like I said, Sydney got lucky, but that's okay. For Shiftry, we still do have Exploud, which while struggled a little bit more, it was still able to knock out Shiftry. And remember, if each Pokemon knocks out one, we have one remaining because it's six on five. It was also able to knock out Cacturn, and while it wasn't able to knock out Crawdont, Thunderbolt, which unlike Aerial Ace, I saved until the very end, did a ton of damage, and thus eventually I was able to knock out Crawdont. And I think you can see how I'm going to use Gyarados against Wallace's Gyarados. Hopefully we get that far. My strategy for Phoebe also had to change. Remember, Waylord was key in knocking out the first Duskloss with Water Spout. Now we need to see, well, that crit kind of helped. But I had to see what I was going to do there. So this is Grudge Binette, and you might be noticing that Exploud is doing a little bit more damage. Well, I guess not there, but I did in fact use some proteins, some calciums, etc. As it turns out, this mod did not just disable experience points, but also disabled in-battle effort values. Meaning the only way to get effort values are through vitamins, which are quite pricey. But by giving more vitamins, I was able to make Exploud a little better and knock out Binet number one. And realistically, Exploud has done its job, just do a bunch of damage to Sableye. Now we have Gyarados. And remember, Sableye has way worse special defense than defense, so Gyarados was a good swap, and after Intimidate, it did nothing with Shadow Ball. Unfortunately, this Binet has Thunderbolt, but I didn't want to swap anything in. We're very water heavy. What I do do is I send in Hariyama and I start using Rock Tomb. This will lower Binet's speed and hopefully allow me to get a nice revenge KO. It's going to be a little harder though than I'd like it to be. I'm going to have to go for D-Dance. It goes for Shadow Ball, Spideff Drop, and then hopefully Fly knocks it out after D-Dance. It doesn't. But what we can do instead, well, I try to see if it's not going to heal, but what we can do instead is Toxic Strats. And yeah, they're a little toxic, but they're working pretty well. And all we need is for Tentacruel to survive because Dusclops, it went for Rock Slide. And that means I can swap in Wobbuffet and we have a 20% chance of this being a really fun victory and we get the 20% chance. And that's why we have Wobbuffet. Oftentimes, there is a 20% chance of turning a loss like that battle into a victory. Not the cleanest battle ever, but clean enough. Glacier, the strategy is largely unchanged. The only real difference is going to be the end. I forgot to equip the Shell Bell, so I only have Citrus Berry, which sucks, but I do set the bulk up up on the heal, which is kind of nice. In the end though, as we knock out all the other Pokemon, Walrein is gonna knock me out with Surf because I don't have as much HP, but Walrein actually is a range to knock out Wobbuffet, so I just go for Destiny Bond. Walrein doesn't get the range, even with Hail, so even without Quick Claw, Wobbuffet was able to finish the battle. Three battles, three victories. But Drake has taken me about two and a half hours throughout all my attempts. Is Gyarados really going to make things easier? Once again, I got to change my strategy up because no more Waylord with Blizzard. But we have used Exploud before as the lead. So we know roughly how that's going to go and that it's going to go fairly well for me. Especially if I get a clutch freeze there. Now what we really want is just for Exploud to knock out Altaria. Altaria cooperates, and now we have our Wobbuffet. I have given it some vitamins to make sure it always will survive Kingdra now, so I don't need any luck unless it got a critical hit. I worry for a second I'm going to run out of Destiny Bonds, but it does attack and I knock out Kingdra. 
So now what we have to do is think. If I send in Tentacruel, it's gonna automatically send out Flygon, and then I can send in Gyarados, and that's going to weaken Flygon's Earthquake. Now it goes for Dragon Breath, but Gyarados, oh, that pair hack sucks. Oh, that second pair hack sucks. But Gyarados is actually really tanky. And Blizzard crits, which I deserved, by the way, after those two para hacks. It gets knocked out by Dragon Claw, but all I need here, all I need here, is either for Hariyama to cooperate or Tentacruel to knock it out with Ice Beam. I go for Tentacruel, and uh, that's not going to be enough. We both seem to have done half damage to each other, but after Citrus Berry, there's no way we knock it out. Oh, I actually tanked that. That's cool. <laughs> oh, well, 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 that was a high roll plus low roll, clearly. Let's go. Four battles, four victories. Now, we know that's going to come to an end at Wallace because of the luck required to get Wobbuffet to work. The question is, once we get past Waylord, how do things change then? Unfortunately, I can't answer that question because I lead with Gyarados. After Intimidate, Waylord can't do all that much. Remember, my special defense is really, really good. So I'm going to go for Thunderbolt. If I had known it was going to use Rain Dance, Thunder would have been better. But it actually goes for Blizzard and misses, which is excellent. It hits with the second Blizzard, but I'm at half HP and Waylord has been knocked out and I still have Wobbuffet remaining. Now, unfortunately, Tentacruel I don't have Earthquake for, which I would have loved but I try to paralyze it with secret power. I'm poisoned, I tank the hydro pump, and would you look at that? Secret power. I then go for Thunderbolt because I want to put it within range for Altari to knock it out with Earthquake, and I don't want Tentacruel to heal, and that's exactly what happens. Now out comes Milotic, and remember, Tentacruel was supposed to wall Milotic, and I started to figure out the timing of Toxic, of Protect, and Giga Drain, and with the timing down, unless there's some annoying critical hits, from full HP, it should always knock out my Lodic before my Lodic has a chance to heal. And that's exactly what happens, even with the Citrus Berry. Now out comes Whiskash. Thankfully, I've got a flying Pokemon, so I don't even have to worry about Earthquake here. We really, really need to paralyze it, but it's a 30% chance. And so far, I'm 0 for 2. If we paralyze it, however, never mind, doesn't matter, Hyper Beam. Instead, what we're going to do is we're going to go into Hariyama and set up a bulk up. So it's got a recharge. I go for bulk up. And now, Surf, Brick Break. Okay, Citrus Berry's good. Surf, let's go. Two Pokemon remaining, including the very annoying Ludicolo which knocks out Hariyama. Now, remember, Tentacruel does a ton, a ton to Ludicolo, because between Leech Seed, between Toxic, and between its Giga Drain, it's gonna lose a lot of health in a hurry. I think about maybe saving Tentacruel, but I realize, nah, that's not a good idea. This battle is over, but it's gonna require one last piece of luck, and I don't know if I'm gonna get it. Here it is. We need to survive, and we need to hit. Unfortunately, we don't survive. And as you know, Shockwave doesn't do enough. Gyarados knocks us out with Hyper Beam. But, seeing as it used Hyper Beam against Explode gave me a really good idea that made me believe for the very first time that we're actually going to win this thing, hopefully in this very next battle. Still going to lead Gyarados. I thought that was an excellent strategy. I was thinking Gyarados would take on Gyarados. Turns out it is the Waylord Defeater. And once again, in three hits with half HP, we've done just that. Now, out comes Tentacruel. But this time, I think about it. And I wonder whether I want to keep Gyarados around. In the end, the last strategy worked, and we get a Hydro Bump miss this time. If I get three hits, there are good odds I actually paralyze Tentacruel. And once again, we're in the same situation where Altaria, this time I go for Dragon Dance, just to make sure because I was a little scared. And Earthquake does do enough to knock out Tentacruel. 
Now, my Lodic, I'm gonna go into my Tentacruel. Other than the Giga Drains I'm using, everything else is pretty much just set in stone how much damage it does. Although I got a critical hit there, and that's a little scary, because I worried that might put my Lodic into healing range. Thankfully, the math was still in my favor, and no healing on my Lodic. Now out comes Whiskash, and once again, Altaria, I choose you. Earthquake is dodged, and I'm trying to paralyze it. No luck so far. Amnesia is not great, but what's gonna happen, thankfully, after Citrus Berry triggers, is that it goes for Hyper Beam, allowing me to send out Hariyama. I think about sending out Exploud, but no, the Hariyama strat worked well. We go for Bulk Up, it goes for Surf, I tank it well, Citrus Berry activates, it goes for Hyper Beam, and we're actually still around. This time, I want to save Hariyama and swap in Tentacruel. Giga Drain, that does decent damage to it. And then I use Toxic, and now, rather than use Protect, I'm gonna go on the offensive. Because of the Liquid Ooze, I go for Ice Beam, hoping that the stacking damage will knock it out, and it does. Now, all I need to do is send out Exploud, and I'm pretty sure I win. Because the only move Gyarados has, which one-shots Exploud, is Hyper Beam. And because it uses Hyper Beam, it cannot move. <laughs> we got Quick Law anyway. Wobbuffets finishes the job. In only two battles, albeit with some vitamins, which took me a while to get, I was able to do what took me four hours. Sometimes in these runs, you just get into a state of tunnel vision. You just don't think of other options. You just want your strategy to work. Thankfully, we had my chat and small ant who, for the record, this video, I do like to think of myself as fairly creative, directly inspired by the one he did in black and white, which I found out I think is his first Pokemon video ever. Great video, by the way. Anyway, I would end the video here, but I know Steven Stone, Steven Stone, is it possible? Let's do it. Now, I'm going to be honest with you guys, there was a strong, strong possibility at some points that this part of the video was just going to get cut out and it would have ended because, again, this is post-game and I don't plan for Steven. It took me seven hours to do this, but in the end, I finally came up with a strategy that may work. Alrighty, so to lead, we use Gyarados because Skarmory is really annoying. It has Aerial Ace, it also has Toxic. So we have to switch in a Pokemon that resists Aerial Ace, but also can't be poisoned, and Aggron is the perfect Pokemon. You can catch a level 44 Lairon in Victory Road, and there is one more rare candy in the extension of the Safari Zone, available only after the post-game. Now we use two Metal Sounds, lowering special defense, and then hopefully we don't miss with Fire Blast. Now I did have to give Aggron Calciums, because it is a range whether or not Skarmory will heal, and we need Skarmory to heal. Steven, like Wallace before him, has many, many full restores. But if everything works out with the Citrus Berry, then Agron will be able to knock out Skarmory. Next comes out our Maldo, and because Agron resists all its other moves, it's gonna go for Water Pulse. And now we're gonna enter another new addition, Smeargle, available in Artisan Cave, and with Heart Scales, we are able to move Tutor Sketch and teach the following. From our Blossom I never used, I sketch Sleep Powder to put our Maldo to sleep. I then get Substitute from the Move Tutor to basically give me another turn in case it wakes up early. From Cacnea, and you can use either Ditto or other Smeargle to sketch the moves onto your Smeargle, we got Leech Seed, and finally, we got from our Sableye Nightshade in order to deal more damage and knock out these Pokemon. For my strategy to work, I need to be behind a substitute as Armaldo faints, because the next Pokemon that's gonna come out is Claydol, and Claydol is absurdly annoying, because if you noticed earlier, there is spikes on the ground, so switching back and forth is going to suck. But, Claydol will alternate between Earthquake, setting up Light Screen and Reflect, but it can also use Ancient Power. However, Agron double resists Ancient Power, and Claydol doesn't have great attack. So we're gonna swap Gyarados and Claydol many, many times. Actually, I believe six times to be exact. 
which will lower Claydol's attack to minimum. Its only moves are Ancient Power, Earthquake, Reflect, and Light Screen. The key to this part of the battle, though, is Leech Seed, not because we want to knock out Claydol, we can do that after. What we need is for Agron not to faint. We actually need Agron for later in the battle, for a very interesting reason. And it's pretty useful now. But after all that switching, we can swap in Smeargle, put Claydol to sleep, and once again, hide behind a substitute. Because Claydol outspeeds, I can just spam substitute, but it doesn't wake up, so that's good. Next comes out Steven's Agron. The strategy here is very simple. Put it to sleep, use Leech Seed, use Nightshade, get rid of it as quick as possible. There is probably going to be a full restore used, and unfortunately there's no way to get Spore, so we have to rely on 75% accurate sleep powder, which is why I have Substitute. It's just better protect, because while I'm sleeping I can set it up. You'll notice here that I'm stalling, because I don't actually need to be behind a Substitute for what's next, and that is Credilly. For about three hours, I was able to consistently get to Credilly, but really do not much else after. So here is the new strat. We tank Ancient Power, and that crit really sucked. We teach Protect to Agron and Protect Giga Drain. That's two power points used. I tried to double up on Protect, but it fails. Three power points used. Now I sub in Absol, which has the pressure ability. I go for Protect, and that's another Giga Drain. Now, I really want the second Protect to work. I could swap out. I think about swapping out, because Tentacruel has the Liquid Ooze ability, which will, instead of healing the Cradilly, as you saw before, it will damage it. But I go for that double Protect, get rid of Giga Drain, and now I know it's going to go for Ancient Power. And if it uses it, it will only have two Power Points left. I think long and hard about what I want, and I swap into Gyarados even though it's weak to get off Intimidate because I know Gyarados will survive. And now, it only has two power points remaining. I could swap in Absol, but even better, I swap in Tentacruel, take a hit, go for Protect, and now Cradilly is out of moves. Unless I miscounted, which is why I go into Absol and it wasn't. Whoopsies, but that's okay. Now it is definitely out of moves. And since it is out of moves, all it has left is Ingrain and Confuse Ray. And Smeargle has the own tempo ability. You might notice I use some PowerPoint ups to get me enough Nightshades. But the truth is, because it doesn't have any moves left, which is the new part of the strategy, I actually can use Tentacruel to set up Toxic and make this go much, much, much faster. Unfortunately, Steven still has a full restore left. So we have to swap back in Tentacruel and we get off another Toxic. And now what I have to do is swap in Smeargle eventually and get behind Substitute. And if it faints while I'm behind a Substitute, then we have about a 50-50 chance of winning this battle. Because Steven's best Pokemon that decimates all of mine is Metagross. Nothing can stand up to this thing. But if I put it to sleep and then swap in Wobbuffet, and as long as it stays asleep for a few turns, or I get Quick Claw, then Wobbuffet can knock it out with Destiny Bond. And after seven hours of attempts, and spending even more hours theory crafting and thinking about how to do this, we have beaten every major battle without gaining a single experience point. This is a super fun challenge, and I'd like to do this for the rest of the Pokemon games, but I have many other challenges coming out soon. Thank you guys for watching this video. Take care.